Okay, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak here. It's a great pleasure. So um, I guess these days cosmologists, all they know how to do is argue about things. So, um, um, so anyway, so I think, we are, I think I'll take a much more positive point of view. I think we are living in a very exciting time, mainly due to data. And it's great to come up with theories and blah, blah, blah. But I think it's, it's much better to, to see where we are in terms of the data. For, for the ones of us that uh, have been interested in, uh, in understanding the properties of the initial conditions, uh, wherever they came from, um, the, it's been very interesting to look at this plot, the um, amount of gravity waves versus the, the departures from scale invariant, uh, the, uh, measurement of the, in, the, in the scalar fluctuations. And for a long time, uh, you know, this plane was, had a huge blob here, much bigger than this plot. Uh, Planck came along, along and reduced uh, this, uh, this uh, range uh, considerably. And in March, by, and, and, and we knew for a, quite a long time that basically Planck was the ultimate machine in order to make this kind of constraints on the amount of gravity waves from the temperature alone. And to do any better than that, we needed to make measurements not at the tens of microkelvin levels, but at the point something microkelvin level, like John talked about, through uh, B-mode polarization. And, uh, and indeed, in March, uh, um, the BICEP team um, announced that they had, uh, in, they had made a huge leap in sensitivity, as we just heard, and reported also a claimed signal. Um, and I think the, the, the first uh, conclusion of this is just to get astounded by, by, the, by the progress, the fact that they are well ahead of their competitors, even though he doesn't want to say. The reason we're arguing about this is because they are the only ones that have gotten there first, okay? And we will see how the things uh, shape up uh, in the future, but this is just a, a, a great, uh, exciting, exciting time. So, of course, since that detection, the issue is so interesting, so important that people um, try to, to um, you know, assess uh, the, the, the significance or the interpretation of this result um, by their, in, on their own uh, merits. And, uh, and I think uh, Paul gave an, a, a nice summary. I will not. Uh, I will not try to give more details on that. I think uh, definitely, if you're a conservative person, the null hypothesis is that it's everything other than gravitational waves. And indeed, you have uh, foregrounds, uh, possible foreground contamination. And this foreground, possible foreground contamination in, a, in our uh, universe, uh, the main component uh, that we have to worry about is dust, little small particles in, in our galaxy emitting microwaves, being aligned with the magnetic field, emitting um, microwaves that are uh, slightly polarized and could, in principle, account for that signal. Whether it can be the entire signal or not is something that is for observations to tell. It's, there's no theory. We cannot make a calculation for first principles. Unfortunately, data is uh, small. There's not much data on this. There's some hints from Planck, and there's more hints on what's, uh, what's to come since the, uh, as, as John said, since, since, since May. So. Um, there were some expectations before. Maybe the expectations were too optimistic, but, but uh, we, we don't know where this uh, will end up. As, so um, there were a lot of, uh, there were a couple of preprints, a lot of discussion on the press. Um, the, finally, a BICEP uh, new, new um, paper, which had some more caveats. But I think the bottom line is pretty obvious. We, we will have more data. What you need to have is more frequencies to make sure the the spectrum of this signal, what is it? Is it dust? Is it a combination? Is it the CME? What is it? And this is coming. So I don't, I think it, th th that's the main, uh, the main uh, message. And it, it's, it's not coming even in, it, we don't even have to wait decades or anything like that. The Planck data is already taken, and we will know about the properties of the dust uh, pretty soon. They have more data at 100 gigahertz. And so I think the field is in a great position. We will know this much better. And you also have to remember that, um, you know, uh, uh, probably we all complain about, the, as Paul complained maybe, that uh, the statement that the R equals uh, zero is, is, uh, is ruled out at seven sigma, and there's the dust, the null hypothesis, blah, blah, blah. However, it's very interesting to understand this number. This means that. Had they not seen anything, their upper limit is much, would have been much below R of 0.2. This means that no matter what, even once we have a, a additional, uh, additional uh, 
frequencies measured at the same sensitivity, we will go well below, even in the next, uh, you know, not so distant future, well below what we know from the CMB with data that is within our reach. So I think um, it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful time. So, but what I want to do now is, um, is put a little bit of this measurement in context of where we were in cosmology in terms of the data before this, because I know not everybody here follows the details of cosmology all the time, and then try to take the point of view of, uh, or, or describe a little bit why this level of gravitational waves is very interesting uh, from the point of view of inflation. It's just not, not just uh, um, a constraint, but the constraint at the level that it's, it's, it's very interesting. So that's why we are also you know, worked up and fight ab uh, 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 about these things. So I think it's, it's important to take a step back and remind ourselves that we are at the 50th year of the cosmic microwave background. The, the paper of the cosmic microwave background was, uh, well, ne next year will be the 50th anniversary of the original paper of Pencils and Wilson to be published. Okay, was published 50 years ago. And since then, the cosmic microwave background, of course, was the, the cornerstone of our understanding of the hot Big Bang and the fact that the universe was in thermal equilibrium and so on. But eventually, starting in 92 with uh, the COBE measurements, we had the, these measurements of the anisotropies in the cosmic microwave background, which gave us uh, the first glimpses of the, the initial conditions, of, of, of uh, things about the initial conditions for the pro process of large-scale structure. So this is just a compilation of various measurements at various times. This is kind of Kobe made measurements on very large angular scales. And it was very clear at that time that um, if you manage, so on degree scales, L's of tens and so on, if you manage to measure, made measurements on, on degree angular scales, then you would be looking at modes that were inside the horizon at the time. Okay, and so you, so if the initial, uh, if, if we were, what we were looking here were fossils from before the hot Big Bang, okay, then we should, from before the hot Big Bang started, if these seeds were put in, in place before, then there should be a, a pattern of peaks in this, in this uh, acoustic, we call them acoustic peaks. And from the properties of these peaks on degree scale, we would get the cosmological parameters. And most interestingly, for the context of the discussions on inflation, if uh, the, the location of the peak was uh, around one degree scale, it means the universe, the spatial surface was flat, and that was the expectation from inflation. Plus the fact that the seeds were indeed a, a, a fossil from before the start of the hot Big Bang. And indeed, there were 10, 10 or 11 years between COBE and WMAP, the, big, the first big satellite. And in between, there were a collection of ground-based experiments that I listed. This is just a collection of all the ground-based and balloon-based experiments that were available just before WMAP flew. And this is an average of those same data points. You can see that the peaks had already been detected in this decade, okay? And the position of the peak was in the right location. So we were talking about fossils from before the hot Big Bang. So these are, this just, uh, you know, launched, it's, it's an amazing finding. And, uh, and of course, we've made much more progress since then with better measurements from WMAP and Planck that made m measurements of many more acoustic peaks that made, uh, allow you to constrain the model parameters in multiple ways and have multiple, uh, consistency checks that, that the whole picture, at least of the evolution of the, of the perturbations from when they were put in there at the very beginning of the hot Big Bang, we understood and we constrained the direct detection of the existence of dark matter, for example, from the, from, from the heights of these peaks. And, and I think I, I put this up, this transparency, not so much, not only to remind ourselves of the history of this field, but also to remind, I think we are in kind of this kind of situation, but for B modes, okay? Just as there was a rush to get multiple uh, measurements from the ground at, at this, uh, at this uh, range, and that all t within 10 years we had, you know, from here to here, I think experimentalists are in, in their way to do this for B modes. And because the level is so interesting, we are going to learn a lot regardless, and hopefully the, the data will show that the, measure, the measurement that, that they had, you know, is, is from cosmological signal. But even if it wasn't, um, we, we, it, it, it would be, it would be great, uh, it would be great um, improvement. But le let me just point out one more thing. In, in this progression of data, so there was 10 years from WMAP to COVID, another 10 years more or less to Planck. Um, now we have so many peaks, so much detail in the cosmological parameters that we were going through some exper uh, uh, trying to, to, you know, to get the next level of detail. And one of the things that was very important was that, um, um, trying to see if there was any evidence that the fluctuations in the, in the, in the, in the, 
in, in, in the initial fluctuations were not perfectly scale invariant, but there were small departures from scale invariant. And there was an expectation from inflationary models, which is given that there is a time scale, the length of inflation, there's a few percent uh, uh, slope uh, difference from one in the slope of the primordial fluctuations. And indeed, this was what you require to fit this data. You cannot fit this data with a perfectly scale invariant spectrum. And I thought that was also a very good. Uh, and by the way, of course, now uh, you can start to argue, yeah, but any kind of value of this NS minus 1 is something that you could feed with some inflationary model. But we're talking, uh, this is if we are discussing the small differences from scale invariant. But other situations give you other, you know, um, concoctions for the early universe give you n much different from one. So n equals to one is is uh, you know a very interesting. And now, okay, the small departures are 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 um, are, are, are model dependent. But not everything was perfect. And in the, and, and in, the, in, the, in the in the in the context of this discussion of bicep, one thing that I think is important to keep uh, in mind is that there was already there were very many tensions and I want to um, and I think most m probably most of them are just statistical flukes and we will iron them out with more data but there was one which is could still be a statistical fluke but is interesting in this discussion which is the fact that if you were to fit the data uh, for for using the small angular scales which is where most of the statistical power is and predict the value of, uh, of, of, the, of the theory at low, uh, at low uh, large angular scales, you predict a curve, and all the data points, the majority of them seem to lie below the, the curve. And that's important for this discussion because what gravitational waves do in this context, the way they were constrained in this plot, was because gravitational waves just add some constant amount of power on large angular scales. So the fact that the data was already low, you know, makes it that if you, if you, if you uh, come with a detection of gravity waves that even increases the data, the, the theory curve even higher, it's more difficult to accommodate. So at this point, um, I mean, I think this is, of course, another, another you know, it's, 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 it's an indirect argument from the theory side of, of why such a large level, like the one so seen by Bicep, it's unlikely. There's, you, in other words, more than unlikely, in, if you were to believe at face value the r equals 0.2, then you have to believe in some other thing. Okay? Something else needs to fix this. And the obvious thing to fix this is foregrounds, right? some contamination. The bicep number is too high because there's something else. And now the question is, how much is this too high? Could it be the entire thing? And that's, I think, uh, something that uh, for more data to, de to decide. But that's the reason why the Re looking also at, uh, at the level of foregrounds and so on became so important because in the context of theoretical explanations, okay, what do you have to do? Okay, you can say, uh, how, do you, how do you lower this? Then you have examples of things that people come up with is uh, uh, we're seeing some, something related to the beginning of inflation, bubble nucleation, some potential that has some shape, and as a result, the inflation is going faster. And so it's like... Okay, it's a big, uh, it's it's a big, a big modification. I think you would have to leave out from the from from the comfort of the simplest possible uh, set of assumptions to explain the data, and uh, so you would be discovering two fantastic things at the same time. Which, um, so so let me let me. Um, I, I want to go move now to discuss a little bit why I th why this uh, um, level of uh, signal is so interesting. Okay, and maybe I will. I will, I will address some of the, of the comments that, that, that Paul makes. So let, let, let me just say that I have a much more humble point of view, okay? I don't want to, uh, or I don't think that we are in the business of, uh, of uh, ex explaining the ultimate theory of the origin of the universe. Maybe we are, I don't know. But I'm in the business, at the moment, the business is to move it in one, one layer back, okay? We had the Big Bang. The Big Bang required some initial conditions. We are asking the question, could these initial conditions be the final conditions of 60 e-folds of inflation, slow roll inflation of some kind? And, and, and unfortunately, and Paul is completely right, I think we, this period of 60 e-foldings of inflation requires some initial condition again. We haven't solved the ultimate question, okay? And that's fine with me, okay? I also understand that given that I'm doing uh, astronomical observations, 
the amount of data that I will get is rather limited, okay? And so I understand that things that, the moment the model starts getting a little bit complicated, I may have no hope of figuring it out. And I don't think there's any theorem that says that we will have to be able to figure this out. And maybe yes, and maybe not. And so, of course, I hope for the simplest possible example because I, that's, you know, more likely that I will be able to figure it out. But, okay, there's no, I don't think that it's more or less scientific to, to you know, while with the data is out there and we don't know if, if it's the simplest possible example and we will be able to figure it out, to stop because if it's more complicated, then we will not be able to figure it out. That's fine. That's life. And I think... I don't think this makes it, this would make the in, this field not signed. It would just make it not interesting, okay? If, if there's just not a way to figure it out, then we move on and work on something else. You know, it's just, uh, that's, I think that's my point of view. But so, um, so in, in any case, I think one, one, one thing, let's take the very minimal approach of what we are doing. We are asking the question if, the, if before the hot Big Bang, there were 60 efforts of inflation, okay? And we need to say that they started somehow and it's fine. Maybe we don't know how to calculate those initial conditions. I'm perfectly aware of this point. And, um, and, uh, and one remarkable thing, I think, is that if you take that uh, point of view and you put yourself in the smallest possible box, you still, uh, so far, you still fit the data. What is the smallest possible box? First of all, um, you, you know, in any model, if, if you postulate there's anything happening before the hot Big Bang, there's a history of the universe at this point. There's also always a mode of fluctuation, which is you advance in this history back and forth in different places of the universe. You advance where you are in this history. That's what we call the adiabatic mode. In an inflationary background, this adiabatic mode is scale invariant, and it's only around this background that this adiabatic mode is scale invariant. So I can put myself in the smallest possible box, which is I will use this mode and not use anything else. I will use just vacuum fluctuations, okay? And this makes a bunch of, uh, if I put myself in this uh, box, I make a bunch of, uh, a bunch of uh, predictions. I, maybe the word prediction is wrong. In this, uh, in this context, certain things follow. What does it follow? It has to be scale invariant. There should not be fluctuations in composition just from this attractor nature of inflation. There cannot be fluctuations in composition, say, between the dark matter and the variance and so on. No fluctuations. And in fact, we haven't observed them. There cannot be what we call local non-Gaussianities, uh, which is an effect of a long wavelength mode on short wavelength. There cannot be any of that because when you produce the, in inflation, wavelength, or in any of these examples in any case, in scale is the, more or less the same as time. So when you, create, when you create fluctuations of different scales, they were created at different times because of the attractor nature of this inflation and solution we are expanding around. Once you create the long wavelength mode first, it becomes locally unobservable. That's the reason why there cannot be fluctuations in composition because these modes cannot affect reheating, but also they cannot affect the later generation of smaller modes. And these are these local non-Gaussianities were constrained very nicely by Planck. And again, we, we saw nothing, okay, there. And I think, and there's other types of non-Gaussianities. Let me skip that a little bit. And basically, in these examples, you, the, the, the interactions in these theories are very weak, and you don't uh, expect any departures from Gaussianity. We, we checked very, very, as to the best of our ability. And again, nothing has, uh, has, has happened. So in that sense, the smallest possible box so far has worked. But I can, one can put oneself into even a, small, a, a smaller box, a tighter box, which is, in, 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 this exam, in, in, in this context, or the predictions just depend on the history that you assume. What is the simplest possible history? The simplest possible history is a history in which the Hubble constant has only one parameter, one time scale involving in it, which is the end of inflation. Uh, and, we, and, and everything is just a function of time over this uh, time scale to the, towards the end of inflation. All derivatives of the Hubble constant are, are the same size. Uh, each e fold, and in those cases, you always get large gravitational waves. And that's the reason why those simple examples, historical examples that we always plot in the RNS plane, are all up there in the, in the place where the bicep has the, and, and, and upcoming experiment have sensitivity. So that's why this level is so interesting, okay? Because if you put yourself in the smallest possible box, that's what you expect. Now, of course, the, I'm putting myself in the small possible, smallest possible box. Is there a guarantee? Is the fact that if I just do a simple modification that the history is a constant plus something else and I put this constant a little bit large, so I make some sort of, for example, like in this hybrid model, there's a phase transition uh, somewhere towards the end and the, and the vacuum energy drops. 
Is this unallowed by physics? Is this terrible? No, it's just a parameter. And what happens then? I, ca I can have no gravitational waves. I can hide them to lower value. Is it unfortunate? Would it be better that there's a theorem that you always have to produ always produce or not always produce? It would be better, but I don't know. If there is not such a theorem, that's, that's life. I don't find it particularly, you know, it's whatever it is. So, um, and of course, the, and, and I think we will, I hope we will hear much more about this from, from, from Eva. The interesting thing about this, uh, and, 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 and I suppose the reason uh, that, that, that we've been invited into this conference is that in those examples, okay, when there's large gravitational waves, there's a clear, um, there's a clear, um, there's, there's a clear connection between the range in field space that, that the, the field is exploring during the 60 e folds of inflation that we actually observe, okay, which is very large in Planck units. And so you have to be very careful to have uh, your potential and so on be flat enough. And of course, from the bottom-up point of view, you can always say there is some sort of shift symmetry. All of these models, even m squared, phi squared, has a, you know, approximate shift symmetry. So this, this by itself, from the, uh, from the bottom-up, is not particularly something, you know, it's, it's, it's a constraint, but okay. Um, but, uh, but, but, you know, from, from the context of this conference, it's very, it's very, very interesting. And so that's the reason why, uh, why an additional reason to be very, very interested in, in, in these measurements that are, that, that are upcoming. So, you know, I think my summary is in, in, for this part is that, um, yes, sure, there's parameters, there's ranges of things, and there's many scenarios. Maybe there's so many, there's so, the parameter space is so large that the, that the most uh, likely outcome is that uh, we will not be able to figure out what happened at the very beginning. That would be sad, but okay, you know. We'll try, and maybe, maybe one day with additional input from some other direction, but we are trying to constrain something that happened. It's just amazing that we are talking about something that happened so early in the history of the universe, and we are being able to make these state statements, even if those statements are qualified with many qualifications, because it's such an extrapolation, okay? So, and, and the data is getting so, so, so good that, uh, that we are in, in, a, in a very, very exciting time. So finally, let me, let me talk about a little bit um, and additional sources of information. So far in this discussion, we've mainly talked about the power, power spectrum or two-point functions of the, of the initial conditions. And that's where we have data already from, the, from, uh, um, from, from measurements. But also, uh, and, and I, I think once you, if you start asking questions, do we really, do you, if, if, can you, Think of a scenario in which you would uh, rule out that it's a slow roll or single field inflation. Most of them, a question like that always goes through trying to understand the properties of the departures from Gaussianity. In particular, for example, this, uh, this uh, um, local type non-Gaussianity in which long wavelength modes affect short wavelength modes is something that you can never produce in single field inflation, okay, in single clock inflation. Um, and, any, and if you're doing uh, perturbations around other backgrounds, you always produce because the, you, you don't get scale invariant spectrum otherwise, so you're always opening yourself to have another sector that, has the, that produces the perturbations, and it always has these departures from Gaussianity. And here, I think the, um, the state of the CMB, um, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit um, not as good in that we are, we've basically exhausted the amount of information that that we're going to get from the CMB. We'll get some more from polarization, but not uh, a qualitative uh, difference. And so in order to make such, a, uh, in order to make such, a, um, such um, statements or trying to constrain these kind of uh, situations, we will, we will need to move away from the CMB, okay? And uh, so questions like, were the fluctuations really in, the sing in this adiabatic mode, or did they, did they come from some other some, uh, other source of fluctuations, and most of most of these uh, questions are not uh, just inflation. It's it, regardless of the mechanism; it's the, the, the same. The, that this is a very interesting observable still applies. And here, I think we will have to move on to look at, at other probes, and uh, most particularly measurements of the large-scale structure of the universe. Um, and uh, 
So the, the, the tracing matter as it's distributed closer to today, that's more challenging because uh, 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 the dynamics is more complicated. There's, there's a nonlinear evolution that can mask some of the effects that one might be looking at. But we also have the good, uh, the good fortune that because of the, the other very interesting problem in cosmology, which is mapping the late time evolution of the universe, and this can be done through this large scale structure in ways that I don't want to go into, there will be a lot of new surveys ma making measurements of vast volumes of space, trying to determine the, the properties of where matter is distributed all over the place around us and to relatively you know, high redshift from an astronomy point of view, but not uh, you know, redshift of 1,000 or anything. Um, and I think the, the other, the other um, um, frontier of the field is trying to see if we can use these, uh, these uh, upcoming surveys to um, to get even better constraints on other properties of the, of the initial conditions. I think this is also a, a place where there's a lot of activity and, and, uh, and the future is also quite bright. So I think, um, let me just conclude that there's very interesting theoretical thresholds uh, in R uh, for the tensor to scalar ratio for the non-Gaussian. This data is getting there for certain, certainly in the, in the case of uh, of uh, gravitational waves, so I think we are in, uh, I, you know, I, I, even though it appears that we are always fighting, I think it's very clear, um, it's very clear where we are headed, it's very clear what measurements we want to do next, and I think, it, 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 furthermore, this upcoming year or two are very interesting because we will get some answers, and so I think uh, it's a great time. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for that presentation. Um, I'll open the floor to questions. Ava, I know. Uh, you, sorry. So, so since there's been so much discussion of the dust foreground, I'm, I'm kind of curious if there is room for theoretical progress on this subject. Things like, does the dust track the synchrotron? You know, for some theoretically understood reason. Are there, you know, are there puzzles that are brought out by the new Planck data that would benefit from? Theoretical work. Um, okay, but I, I think I think um, let me just spend a, a couple of seconds saying what these models typically are. Okay, so um, there's these uh, dust grains. For, in order to be able to make a prediction for these maps, you need to know how they are distributed in space in our galaxy, their distribution of sizes, their distribution of shapes, how they get aligned with the magnetic field, and at the end of the day. All of these models are parameter, have now distribution functions of this, distribution functions of that, that you integrate over to get some, some, uh, some prediction. And the, the number of things you're assuming along the way, it gets so big that at the end of the day, we have to measure everything. So I don't know that there's, uh, there's. Uh, you guys spend a huge amount of effort on. I think it's, uh, I think it's, uh, I think it's a much harder problem. Maybe you can subdivide it into many problems, each of which is, uh, you know, is as hard as that. But in any case, they, 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 they require a lot of measurements. I think it's something that is uh, it's empirical. It's not. Uh... Uh, thank you. Any other questions? I see one over here, Emil. <laughs> so suppose we land in the unfortunate situation that much of what BICEP is seeing is dust. What are the prospects for cleaning the foregrounds out of the measurements, and what would be your expectation for what ultimate sensitivity we could achieve? Um, so, I think I think um, I think the prospects are very good, especially if what we are discussing. So the question: What's the ult of course the more foregrounds there is, if you think of some ultimate level of R that you can get, it will go up. That's obvious, okay? But for the point of view of this R is equal 0 0.1, 0 0.2, the, the big, large field models, I don't think it's a big uh, problem because once once you have two frequencies, you can see if you, know, you can subtract them out to get rid of the CMB, see if everything is uh, you know uh, anything is left. And this can only fail if there is a third component. We can discuss the data. Synchrotron might be a third component. But this is probably somewhere around an order of magnitude below, a factor of a few below. And then you can get, make progress by making another, uh, taking another frequency. Okay? It's a question of how well you can do from the ground, et cetera. But I don't think, um, I, and now, 
so I don't think it's terrible or anything. I mean, it's a, it's a little bit bigger than what was expected before, but it's not. I don't think it's a showstopper, and uh, maybe a delay. It's probably a, you can think of it as a delay, and and in the, in the ultimate the ultimate uh, level will go down. I don't want to quote a number because this is very much dependent on things that we will we are going to learn a lot when Planck releases the, the data soon, but we don't know now because, like, how much of the sky is contaminated by what amount is again something we need to measure. You know, the bicep patch is very clean, no, 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 no questions about that. Now, how, how many patches of that, of that clean, cleanliness there are across the entire sky, how bad it gets, as you, you know, this is, the, the, the detail of the last number depends on these kind of things that I don't know. Thank you. So we'd love to go on with more questions, but I'm afraid, to, uh, I can personally think of plenty of questions I'd like to ask the speakers. <laughs> but <laughs> I've tried to discipline myself to not do so in view of the time. And now I'm going to have to ask us all to, uh, in a moment, thank the speakers again and pursue the discussion during the break.